Hello, everyone. Welcome to this month's installment of Meet the VC. Uh, we're going to get started in just a moment as people log in. Um, we should have uh, at least 100 people in the audience, maybe 200. Uh, so we have a good group today um, for, for a VC I'm really uh, excited about. Uh, so let me just start off quickly as people settle in, um, introducing myself. Uh, my name is Dan Dato. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Early Growth. Uh, I've had a long career uh, starting off in the finance space, but for the last 20 years, I was a serial entrepreneur, uh, starting and growing companies, raising capital. Uh, for, for the entrepreneurs in the audience, uh, I've been in your shoes a bunch. Uh, I'm coming to you today from, from Los Angeles, from Santa Monica, uh, but I was born and raised in the New Jersey area. And as we do these events, a lot of times our VCs are West Coast based. That's why I'm so excited today that we've got some East Coast rep uh, coming, coming to you guys. Um, just some ground rules here as, as we get started. The, the webinar will, will be about 40 to 60 minutes long uh, with some Q&A. Uh, as you have Q&A um, questions for Nick uh, or Phil, um, just put them in the Q&A functionality in Zoom. Uh, we'll be monitoring that the whole time. But also as you come in, introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, in the chat, make sure you're chatting not just to the panelists, but to all attendees. Uh, and give us a quick intro, your name, your company, one sentence uh, about your company. Uh, and, when you, and where you're dialing in from today. Uh, I know we're gonna have a, an international audience, uh, so really interesting to see where folks are coming from today. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and posted uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, so no need to take notes uh, as you're going through this, you'll have access to, to take a look at it afterwards. Uh, just a little bit about early growth for those of you who don't know uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, early growth takes care of the entire finance stack for early stage startups. If you're building a company, you're looking to raise capital, it's really, really important that you focus on the things that are most important to your success. Quite often, that means your product, your service, your customers, your team. And so it's really important that you surround yourself with, with great experts in a number of different areas so things that are important, like your finances and your financial foundation, um, your sales models, your projections, your budgets, and all those things are top notch as well. So while your team focuses on, on your customers, you've got a partner like Early Growth who can help you make sure that you have no financial missteps and that finance becomes a strategic advantage of your business. Uh, as I mentioned, we take care of the whole stack, whether that's day-to-day -day, um, accounting and bookkeeping, month-to-month -month financial reporting um, for, for founders, for management teams, for boards of directors and investors, uh, the things that you do on an annual basis, whether it's your strategic finance or preparing taxes, something that unfortunately we all have to do, uh, help managing your cap table. Um, and we don't just represent startups, we represent a lot of startup investors as well and help them keep their books. Uh, early growth's been around a while. I need to update this slide because we just had our 12 year birthday uh, a month ago or a few weeks ago. Um, but, but the folks here at Early Growth, the CFOs that, that you work with, uh, these are folks that bring tons of experience, 25, 30 years experience in the finance field uh, and, and raising capital is second nature to these folks. Um, so they're great advisors uh, and people that you wanna have sitting around that table uh, as you're starting to think about how to grow your business. Uh, what we do here does not happen alone. Um, and, and as I said, building a, a great business means building a great team around you, uh, both internally and externally. And so as we put on these webinars, we've got a, a great team around us that helps us. Um, we, we often talk about this, this idea of together we grow. And, and that's how we, we build um, our business. That's how we help you build your business. And Early Growth has been committed to building a community over time. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and 
I am going to call on some of our partners uh, to just say a little bit about themselves. This is kind of a dream team. Our first, our first company here is uh, Carl Eppers at Trinet. So Carl, uh, I just activated you as a panelist. And you should be able to come up here and give your talk. Tell us a little bit about Trinet. Uh, I'm seeing some technical issues. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go on to, to the next partner. And as I can get Carl, um, we, will, we will do that. Um, but right now, um, OK, Car Carl, we've got you. All right, unmute yourself. Uh, let's get your video going. You're up there, awesome. Okay, so tell us a little bit about Trinet, Carl. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, we've been around for 30 years providing back office HR infrastructure for growing companies, and providing Fortune 100 level benefits. But, uh, you know, the real reason why everybody's here is because I, you guys at Early Growth just do a fantastic job being engaged in the community. and. Uh, you know, Nick Adams is the best in the business. He, we have a really good speaker here. He's a guy I've met a couple of years ago. Uh, f fantastic guy in real life and uh, a, a, and a, an amazing mentor and uh, resource for everybody in the startup community. So uh, more so than a, a pitch of Trinet than a pitch of early growth and Nick, uh, you guys got the best, best in the business here. So this is going to be a really good one for y'all. Awesome. Thanks, Carl. I mean, just a personal story from my perspective. Uh, last company I started, the first two phone calls I made were to early growth and to Trinet um, to get our finances set up and to make sure we had a great HR foundation to start building our team. Um, all right. Next up, Jason from Row Business Bank. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so thanks for, to early growth for putting this on. Super excited to be here. Thanks to Phil. Um, you know, Row is a full service digital business bank. Um, we have 75 million in FDIC insurance. We work with companies that have raised venture capital to profitable startups, really encompassing everything from core banking to corporate cards, expense management, bill pay, and even to capital markets. So we're working with a ton of companies, a lot of companies together with early growth. Um, it's been really awesome so far. So thanks for, for having us. Awesome, Jason. I know Row's a new player on the block. Yeah. Um, but, but being the, the new, uh, the new kid means you guys have a lot of tools and a lot of focus that isn't tied down by legacy and really built around how to help, uh, young startups grow. So yeah. Thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. All right. Next up, Zach from Lighter Capital. All right, Zach, take yourself off of mute, get, get your video going and come join us. Hey everyone, this is Zach from Ladder Capital. We've been around about a decade and um, we provide growth capital solutions uh, anywhere from 50,000 to 3 million to early stage startups and growth stage tech companies. And uh, yeah, I just really like to thank Dan and the early growth team for including us. We're really excited about the content today. So uh, thanks, Zach. We, we work with Lighter and have been working with Lighter for, for years and years, and they really offer a fantastic alternative finance solution to, to companies that have recurring revenue. Uh, it's a great way to grow your business in a non-dilutive manner. Uh, so make sure you take a look at them. As you start to build your own finance stack of building your company, it's not just equity investors like Nick. Um, it's not just banks who might be coming in with loans or venture uh, debt, but it's companies like Lighter Capital that can also add to the mix. So it's a really great option for you. Great. Thanks, Zach. Uh, next up is Alejandro with Cushman and Wakefield. All right, Alejandro, go. Yeah. How are you? Good. So thank you again for uh, for having me and having Cushman as part of the event. Great to uh, have partnered with Early Growth and, and Phil later for the past few years. Looking forward to connecting and, and hearing from Nick, of course. I can see you uh, in the camera. But just a quick quick introduction. So my team and I lead the uh, tech advisory practice for Cushman and Wakefield here in New York. And what that means is we really focus on advising high growth companies and startups 
in the technology world to help scale operations as they grow, hire additional personnel, raise capital, and need to scale operations into other markets. And that really means creating a, a plan that's flexible, cost effective, and incorporates, you know, the co-working component. And, you know, what we've seen this year, it, frankly, it's been obviously, as you can all imagine, has really been a pivot uh, from a, a landlord's market to a tenant's market in most major cities. So we have seen landlords uh, really stretch their pro forma to get things finalized with the prospective tenant. And even from the co-working uh, perspective, you know, I just did a deal last week with WeWork where they dropped their price by a little over 40%. So a lot of opportunities right now. I'm happy to be a resource, even if it's exploratory for, for anybody on this call. And, um, and yeah, looking forward to, to, to working with you all and, and, and continue to expand the, the relationship. Awesome. Alejandra, thanks for joining us today. I look forward when we're all back working in the office. Oh, and I'm in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thanks for joining us today. Uh, we do have one other partner that wasn't able to join us. Um, today is Veterans Day here in the U.S., and so it is a, it is a holiday, but I did want to make sure to thank uh, Cooley, our law firm. When we used to do these events pre-pandemic uh, in New York City, we would do them at Cooley's offices down in Hudson Yard. Uh, I've been a Cooley client. My last startup, I hired Cooley uh, as our attorneys. And when you're putting together a dream team, having a law firm like Cooley, um, who is, again, a leader, not just in terms of representing startups, but also representing startup investors, having them on your side uh, is an amazing strategic advantage. So, so thanks to Cooley. I am going to uh, share my screen again and uh, bring up our uh, slides, if I can figure out how to do that. Um, okay. So, all right, so we're back. Um, so just a quick thing, uh, we're moving on here. Just wanna let you know, we have a promotion running. Um, and, uh, it's not too early to get ahead of your taxes. Let's just start thinking about the tax returns that you're gonna to need to file next year. You'll wanna start your planning on that now while you can still take some actions to, uh, to, to take the most advantage uh, of your tax position. Uh, this can be anything, even as a very, very early stage startup uh, that might have limited revenues uh, and no profits, and you might be thinking tax is an issue, you do have available to you things like R&D tax credits uh, which you can get money back from the government um, for uh, your uh, employee payroll taxes. And so you can find yourself saving six to 10% uh, on, your, on your overall uh, employment costs through R&D tax credits. So now's the time to get ahead of it. So we've got a promotion running. Um, you, can, you can check it out at, at earlygrowth.com slash tax promo. Uh, and anytime you want to get in touch with us after this, you can send an email to webinars at earlygrowth.com. All right. I uh, want to do a quick poll here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up for folks uh, just to get a sense and to give uh, Nick and Phil an idea of who's in the audience. Just let us know if you're currently fundraising and at what level uh, you're fundraising. I'm gonna give uh, a few minutes, uh, or a few seconds rather, um, for that poll to be completed. Uh, we've got about 70 people so far. Um, so get in there and answer it. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I'm gonna introduce today's moderator. Uh, so Phil Rader uh, has been with Early Growth for two years. Uh, he's our East Coast market manager based uh, in, in New York City and takes care of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, basically um, the, 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 the New York, the greater New York, Philadelphia, all the way out to, to Pittsburgh. Uh, and Phil's a, a Pittsburgh native. So Phil, if you want to come in off of mute, I'm going to hand this over to you. What I'm going to do though, before I do, uh, is, is end the poll and share the results so we can see what we're looking at in our audience here. Uh, this is pretty similar to what we, what we normally see. Uh, about half our attendees are in the process of raising a seed round. Um, and, and so uh, keep that in mind, uh, Phil and Nick, uh, of, of our audience makeup as you go on. But Phil, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and to introduce our, our, our star for today, Nick. 
Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Uh, Phil Rader, I kind of come to a full circle within the financial services. I began my career in financial advising, came up to New York uh, doing deal origination for a low real market private equity firm, and then was lucky enough to find early growth two years ago. And yes, I am now a lifer in the ecosystem. I fell in love with it and I would probably never leave. Um, yes, thank you for the ghost stealers there, but I won't hang on that. Um, yeah, really, um, my background really focuses on all types of business developments, kind of have that finance background and being able to make sure that I can bring as much ecosystem resources, not only from just the New York area, but kind of all the way out through the Midwest to the Northeast and um, beyond with obviously the strength of early growth. So uh, if you have any further questions after this, feel free to follow up with, my, uh, with me. But without further ado, the star of the event, love to introduce uh, Nick Adams, co-founder of, M of uh, Differential Ventures, focused on the seed stage, data-focused entrepreneurs, to be data, but I'll let him give a little bit more background on himself and uh, probably do a better justice. Hey, thanks, Phil. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so that, that's that's pretty much it. Um, uh, data focus uh, entrepreneur. That's that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, no, I'm I'm, I'm uh, good to be here. I, I've worked a lot with pretty much all the all the companies that are sponsoring this, so appreciate you guys and saw a bunch of familiar names in the. Um, in the attendee list too. So um, good to see your, your names, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Differential Ventures. Started the firm uh, three years ago last month. Um, and we're now uh, investing out of our uh, fund one, $20 million seed fund. Uh, our uh, formal fund two uh, launches in April. Um, and we're actually in, in the process of closing a, uh, a pre-seed uh, opportunity fund as we speak. Um, so it should be another $20 million there. Um, and our focus, as Phil said, is, is really around um, mostly B2B, uh, enterprise, uh, AI, machine learning type companies. Um, so kind of up and down the entire stack of, of AI machine learning, anything from kind of backend infrastructure uh, to make, uh, make systems work better, uh, more efficiently, faster, um, to middle platforms of how do you enable data scientists and engineers to better deploy data science throughout the organization, and then obviously applied AI solutions. So, um, you know, one-off use cases solving business problems with, a, with an applied AI. Um, that's, that's us, that's the firm is a, at, a, at a high level. Um, I can talk more about me if that's interesting, um, but I'll let Phil take it from here. Oh well, yeah, I guess that just digging a little deeper, and I know everyone's always kind of within the ecosystem understanding how do you land in the seat that you're in now? You've obviously been at this a little while, a couple of years, uh, you know, at uh, different ventures, but kind of where your career trajectory took you to this point and how you became the VC you are today. Yeah, I think everybody's got a bit of a different journey. So um, mine's, I guess, you know, a little unique. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Boston, um, but was um, uh, far from, you know, kind of the uh, old, old stodgy money in Boston. I grew up pretty, pretty poor. Um, uh, you know, family was, uh, grew up mostly with my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather dug holes for a living for the city of Beverly. I kind of split my time between South Boston and, and the North shore of, of, uh, of Boston. Uh, so came from kind of a unique background in, in that regard. Um, went to Brandeis for undergrad. Um, you know, mercifully was, was a pretty good baseball player at the time. So, uh, hitting a baseball, um, probably got me into Brandeis. Um, I always had a pretty good brain in high school. It wasn't, wasn't a great student. Um, so fortunately I could hit a baseball. Um, it's, it sol solves a lot of, uh, you know, pre 19 year old, pre 18 year old, uh, you know, kind of uh, tendencies to not be, not be a great student. Um, and I showed undergrad to be a lawyer. Um, couldn't have hated anything more. Uh, no offense to the Cooley guys, glad they're not on here. Really respect what they do, but uh, really couldn't have hated anything more than, than that. Um, mercifully, uh, somebody hired me into a, into a, uh, a tech job when I was about 23, 24, after I had my, you know, post-college, um, oh shit moment of, I, I just wasted four years of, of my time and like $200,000 of, of money to, uh, you know, not know what I want to do. Um, so got in the sales world, um, and, uh, fortunately just things just kind of took off from there. It was with a few companies that did really well, um was one of the first employees uh, in the US for a European based company uh, called Bassware, um, was given way too much responsibility for a 25 year old kid, 
um, became uh, VP of sales there, ran sales, uh, some marketing, product management for them for about five years. And um, then went to Opower uh, in DC before their, before their IPO. And after Opower, I went to a company called Rage Frameworks where I launched a, a NLP, natural language processing engine. Um, and the company was later sold to, um, to Genpact uh, in, in India. Along the way, I went back to school a couple of times, uh, did my MBA in corporate finance at Northeastern, um, did a master's in global finance at um, uh, NYU and Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So uh, I've kind of worked all over the world, uh, spent a lot of time in Europe, uh, ran a team in India, um, went to grad school in, in Hong Kong, um, and probably a few smatterings of, of other things I've done. Joined the venture world in 2016, um, uh, was with Flatiron Investors here in New York. I um, was there for about a year and a half as a venture partner and then um, realized it wasn't going to be the right long-term fit for me um, uh, and rather naively and overconfidently went out and started started my own venture capital fund. And that's sort of the the short story of that. And then the last three years have been, uh, you know, it's a whole other probably conversation, but uh, that's sort of the, the journey to getting to where I am now. I mean, it, it's quite the journey. I like it. It's made a large story to this point and you obviously – I think you can resonate with a lot of these entrepreneurs because you took you took the same leap of faith and risk taking that they did, and you know, you blood, sweat, and tears, you made it happen. So, uh, I was curious: Are you actually uh, fluent at all Mandarin from your time in Hong Kong, or no? No. I learned how to order uh, iced coffee, and I well, can tell it, I, I, I could speak. I could do that in Mandarin, uh, and then I could. I used to be able to tell a cab to turn left or turn right in uh, in Cantonese, but I sort of I sort of lost that part and that's that's about it that's the extent of it mercifully being an american like people always sort of you know around the world uh people expect you to really not know their their language yeah. laws. They just kind of coddle us um so it, it's it's really easy <laughs> <laughs> everybody, 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 everybody meets us where we are and, and we we just don't get to their to their level usually love it and uh you know obviously with your story kind of having resonated with early stage tech teams gone to the through the exit and everything else so i was always curious to understand you know maybe how when you're talking to founders how you like to be pitched or how you like to be contacted if there's different certain preferences there or maybe any pet peeves that you can point out to the group yeah um yeah so i come from a sales background and and you know for me like preparation is sort of sort of everything um I'm, I'm, it's like everybody read the same blog or, or went into the same, you know, webcast like this and, and heard, you know, that you should qualify your, your VCs and ask them how they invest and this and that. And I think that makes sense at certain points. Um, I think for like, you know, seed stage, you know, uh, first meeting, like just get to the point, like, you know, you're, do, do, do your homework, like everything exactly, you know, size checks be right. The industries we invest in are all on the website. My, you know, my background is there. Um, so I, I find it always a little bit like frustrating or a waste of time when, a, when somebody comes on a call and, you know, asks us about, about us without specific questions, um, that they want to know, cause it's all right there. And as a salesperson, I never would have, you know, dreamed of walking into a sales meeting and being like, mm -hmm. who are you guys? <laughs> you know, what, what <laughs> it's, uh, you kind of need to have your story ready to go. Um, so yeah, obviously like want to get to know everybody before we ever write a check, but I think in the you know, first meeting. You know, if you have 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you know, 45 minutes, whatever it is, like, just get right into it. Um, and, you know, who are you? Why is it important? And, and like, why are you why are you unique? You know, why are you going to win the space? Um, I think that's sort of the, the best way to, to to approach me. And once we get that out of the way, then we can talk about all the other all the other stuff and figure out if it makes sense to you know get to know each other more. Um, so it's kind of high level. I think just being being preparation. I, I don't mean you know to be unfriendly or anything like that. It's just like. You know, it's a. Uh, we all know why we're here. I feel like, and we may as well make the make the most of the time. Completely understand. And so, talk. That's more like into the meeting. Everything else, I guess, to get that meeting is one piece too. So whether that's through other investors, service providers, at warm intros, cold outreach, like kind of go dive into kind of little things you've seen there or have not liked. Yeah, um, great question. I mean. So we're all about data as, as we've already established. We really like data. My partner, David is, you know, one of the more, you know, probably brilliant minds in, in data science, um, in, in the world, um, you know, was one of the primary architects behind Renaissance technologies and their, um, you know, pretty remarkable, uh, quantitative hedge fund. 
Uh, so we like data. Um, so for for us, like we look at every deal, like whether it comes in, you know, cold, something, you know, really yeah. off the wall, crazy, not in our thesis to, to our, you know, LinkedIn or cold to our, um, you know, we have a, a, a field or a, um, you know, screen on our website where you can upload information and tell us about you. And somebody on our team looks at every single deal, like without mm -hmm. a doubt. Um, we're on track to see about 3,800 this year. So we don't, we're just not able to get back to everybody, unfortunately. Um, I, I wish we could. I wish I could, you know, have a better way of, of, of doing that without just a kind of cold automated thing. Um, and we're working on it, but, um, you know, somebody looks at every single deal. The, the best ways to reach us, um, you know, through a connection um, is obviously through another VC if they're leading the rounds um, or, you know, really liked you, but it's not in their scope or thesis or whatever. Um, that's great. Uh, you know, certainly we, we take those seriously. Um, entrepreneurs that, that know us have, have pitched us before, or, you know, our, one of our portfolio companies is, is a really good way of, of getting in. Um, mm -hmm. They tend to be really selective, I find, um, in terms of sending us deals. Um, because they, they, you know, they know, they know how much volume we have and how hard it is to get investment. So they tend to be really discerning, um, and, and kind of filter things out for us, um, in a lot of, in a lot of ways. And then, um, you know, thirdly is through our service providers. Um, I think, you know, groups like I, I'm pretty sure every company on on this, you know, call um, has sent me a deal somewhere along the along the way. Um, and you know, this part of what you're trying to do is like sit in the middle and help out the funds you work with, the companies you work with. Um, and it's you know, usually easier for for you know companies to get in touch with you guys, build a relationship, and, and get to a VC. Um, so I think that's sort of like an under, uh, used, underutilized approach to, to meeting us. Understood. And you can you kind of walk through that a little bit, but I guess and everything's on your website for what you do in terms of your thesis and, uh, your check size, but I guess internally, how does your firm kind of improve investments? How do you guys kind of go through your investment decision process? It's a little uh, more granular on that end. Yep. So, um, we have... I have my annual LP meeting tomorrow. So this is all pretty, pretty fresh in my mind. Um, so, uh, you know, for us, we do, uh, we do two deal flow meetings a week on Fridays. We meet, um, uh, we actually take our deal flow for the week and divide it amongst our team. Um, everybody goes in makes comments, makes an initial, uh, you know, pass or, or leave it to talk about. Um, so we kind of hammer through the new deals on Friday morning. Um, figure out next steps, you know, first meetings, who's going to take it, so on and so forth. Then on Mondays, we do um, a bit of a longer meeting, which is reviewing our portfolio, what what we need, you know, for, for that. And then um, everything that's a later stage in our diligence process. So beyond the first meeting, basically. Um, that's where we start filtering things through. Um, so of, of all the pitch decks we receive, we, we usually meet between 15 and 20% uh, annually. This year, we're at 18%. Um, and then, you know, it, it just kind of whittles, whittles itself down there. But, you know, it's, the, the math is hard. I mean, it, it's, um, you know, we, we're, like I said, we're going to see close to 4,000 deals and we're going to make probably eight new investments this year. And then um, a handful of follow on investments into our, into our existing portfolio. So, you know, the math is, is just, it's just, it's tough. Um, you know, there's, there's just a lot to, to manage and, and, and to look at uh, and to as an entrepreneur to like, you know, rise to the top, but if you're in and around our thesis, like we're spending time on it. Once we take a first meeting, um, usually it starts out one of two paths. So um, our partnership today is pretty, pretty, um, we operate very flat, um, partially just because we think it's the right way to do things and partially because we have pretty different skill sets. So I come, you know, sales, marketing, uh, product management background, right? Um, been through the startup thing, have gone betting companies that didn't have a damn thing, trying to figure out how to like make your first marketing content, close your first deal, get your first reference, whatever it is, um, you know. And then I've also known companies that are you know public and and you know or going public and being acquired and so forth. So I kind of have like my skill set of things where I'm I'm good. And fortunately, because and Mitchell is pretty similar to me, um, he he's you know just you know older, um, yeah. has done a lot of the same stuff, you know, about five years in venture. And then David's very technical. So the great thing is like, I don't have to be, I'm like product manager technical, but I don't have to be David technical. And that's kind of a huge saving grace. So for us, we sort of divide and conquer in, in those ways a lot. 
And, um, you know, usually you'll kind of, depending on the type of company and you know, all of our bandwidth and everything else in a given week, you'll kind of end up on like the David track uh, where you're, you know, going through a technical-ish meeting uh, earlier on, or you're going down the, you know, kind of, uh, you know, Mitchell, uh, Tiffany, our, our associate, uh, and, and Nick track where you're probably doing more of like the MBA and BC and, and you know, go-to-market type conversation. And then from there, we, we like, you know, exchange notes and, and next meeting is generally, you know, the, the inverse of whatever you had uh, for, your, for your entry point. And, um, you know, if we get through those kind of two, you know, initial meetings, then it starts getting into like, you know, more in-depth stuff where we have a, um, we have a light diligence process and a deep diligence process where, you know, light diligence kind of where, you know, somebody's doing some background on, on the market, um, you know, looking at what's new, what are the recent, you know, fundings, um, who are the real competitors, what are the big companies doing, um, you know, starting to find out a little bit more about, about the team. And then deep diligence usually like we're on our path to term sheet and uh, and a deal. Um, so that's when we start getting into your data room and looking through all that fun stuff. So that's kind of the, the high level of it. Um, I'd say where you know I've learned in the last couple of years is we tend to be pretty uh, pretty pretty thorough on on the seed investing side of things. Um, mm -hmm. I'm you know we, we've had you know candidly three three deals this year that we got into that deep diligence phase where we found some really <clears throat> strange stuff in um in a data room or in a founder agreement or you know contracts missing for strange reasons or the use of of, of you know funds was you know questionable and you know we've had to walk away from those deals but remarkably there were other investors who have put money in or you know plan to put money in without doing that type of homework and it's it's scary it's, it's a weird time to be uh to be an investor in kind of this you know sort of um uh, very dispersed world of, of, you know, high unemployment and, and uh, a, a, you know, stalled economy. And then this like overheated, you know, crazy competitive uh, venture capital market where money just flies regardless of due diligence. So we're definitely more, more thorough on the seed stage. Um, but I think it really, um, you know, pays off for us. No, and I absolutely love that when you're talking about the diligence, how thorough you are, because you hinted on it where I love this and Oh, VCs raise fundraise too. You talk about you have your LP meeting. So all of that diligence is done because you have your LPs you're ra raising from over and over again for your funds. So I like to kind of any founders understand the trickle of where the capital is coming from before you make that decision to go into their company. Um, <laughs> it's uh, <clears throat> definitely flows down. And the worst thing I can do is put somebody, you know, our investor money out to work and have it go into a place where it shouldn't shouldn't be and, and something we could have hopefully caught. So, um, you know, for us, it's a big deal. <clears throat> and I sort of, you know, live, live by this uh, for uh, this motto and, and this sort of belief for, for us, but also for our portfolio companies of, you know, it's the exciting, you know, uh, the promise of what you can do and, and, you know, the excitement of what's new about you that will get you in the door for a deal or an investor or whatever else. And it's all of the other really boring shit that closes the deal. <laughs> it's, you know, after you get past that first meeting or so, then it's like, how buttoned up are you? You know, if you're trying to sell to LinkedIn or Microsoft or, you know, some huge company, only like the, the top, you know, 0.1% of startups can get through that sales process on flash alone. Like now it becomes like, you know, what's your roadmap? You know, what are your financials like? How, how are you going to service us? We're, we're a behemoth and could swallow you in two minutes if we turn this on to our, employee base. So like, you know, what's your customer success roadmap? Um, you know, and, and what are the just, you know, details mechanics of, of our contract together. Um, and I think that gets overlooked a lot the early, you know, earlier stages of companies, um, just how buttoned up you kind of need to have at least your story around all of that. Especially selling enterprise, like you said, okay, enterprise security, uh, like, you know, privacy. I mean, you can't, you can't fake most of it anymore. Completely understand. And I guess with that, we walked through kind of, I think your rigorous diligence process really prepares them for, because you are the you are the sales mind on this. You have to be that rigorous because that's how rigorous your customers are going to be. Um, but what do you think kind of few areas where you add a kind of unique or disproportionate advantage of as uh, being an investor for these founders? Yeah, for us, I mean, it's, it's largely, um, you know, our entrepreneur background, but I mean, more importantly, it's really our focus on AI machine learning. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned, that was my background as a, as an operator. Um, so I think we got a pretty good sense of, you know, what, 
what what buyers are looking for, what they need, and how they want to be talked to. Um, but more importantly, you know, we can kind of unleash David on on uh, you know technical issues, and again, that's sort of how we divide and conquer things. So, you know, uh, we're we're in diligence with the company right now, where you know I'll hop on a call and and you know David will join, but we'll just hammer out the the sales model, the go to market model, and and poke some holes in it and see see what the responses are, um, and figure out kind of you know how much we usually need to. Uh, um, kind of hedge uh, in terms of expectations and, you know, what things um, the, kind of understand the, the founder's strengths and weaknesses as they think about running their business. Um, and then, you know, and, you know, David's not really going to be the guy to do that at this, this point, um, you know, but um, likewise, you know, I don't have to go set your AI strategy or your scalability strategy. You know, that's a conversation for him. Completely understand. And I guess we're talking a lot because you are very industry focused with machine learning and AI. Uh, but I guess on more of a deeper landscape in the overall VC, um, we work with a lot of different programs to kind of addressing the underrepresented founders and the flow of capital and seeing what kind of what you've been seeing in the overall ecosystem. I know there's certain programs I work with partners on kind of first generation, second generation immigrant founders, uh, founders of color, founders, uh, women founders, female founders, just really different programs supporting all this, just seeing kind of what you've been seeing in the turn of the tide over the last, you know, six, 12 months or so. Yeah, I think that, you know, look, it's, it's, it's personally uh, important to me, like, you know, I'm a Irish Catholic kid, you know, white guy from Boston who, you know, fortunately my life has been made exponentially better by people that don't look like me, don't think like me, don't, don't sound like me. And, um, you know, that's really stuck with me since, you know, I've, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, growing up Irish Catholic kid and then ending up at a, a Jewish college in Boston was like pretty eye opening for me to really change, you know, Boston's a small little community in a lot of ways. It's not very diverse. Uh, but, but Brandeis was like a totally new experience for me where I was, you know, a minority amongst, um, amongst people who were used to be minorities. And from there, like I've always just self-selected into, um, you know, people who are saw the world differently from me. And uh, going to school in Hong Kong was like, you know, kind of the pinnacle of that. Where mm -hmm. you know, I'd travel around Asia with with my friends who are, you know, my best friends in the world now. Um, and not in a mean way, but they would like point out, you know, my white privilege in certain cases, where where a waiter or a waitress or somebody would treat me differently from from them. Or uh, would, you know, we'd be out and they'd, they'd point out how, you know, we'd, we'd be in Manila in the Philippines and they'd be like, you know, everybody's watching you to see what you do, how you act, how you behave. And it was really, it was really eye opening. Um, uh, it was, it was, you know, helpful for me and, and, you know, hence personally important. But I also think, you know, as a, as a fund, as, as a, you know, specific to differential, uh, you know, partnerships come together the way they are, uh, the way they do sometimes when you just, you know, figuring out how to put the, put the money together and go. And we didn't have, we didn't come out of Sequoia and, or Andreessen with a few hundred million dollars uh, to back us. So we were, you know, scrapping to pull together, fundraise our first fund. So we're not the most diverse group today, but we self, we all select for it um, in our hiring and, and in our investment approach. Um, but even beyond that, I think it's, you know, just being aware of our biases mm -hmm. and being data geeks. Like that's something that I think, you know, we do in every single meeting. Um, like, you know, <clears throat> I know that I will never be completely unbiased from my background. It's not possible. I can't pretend to be, I don't want to say I am. I can sit here and tell you, you know, what my friends look like and, and everything else, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't matter. Like I'm always going to have bias just like everybody else is. And for me, it's just being aware of what they are and bringing other people around me to like, round out that view and bring a different perspective to the table from an investment perspective. I think that's played out pretty well in our portfolio already. And we're, um, you know, we're hiring again now for our team and, um, you know, we'll, um, you know, look to continue to, you know, diversify it the way we, um, the way we look at deals through, through our next hire. We've also invested in a company called Knockery, which is literally this, it's, um, it's, you know, video interview assessment platform um, to, rate people on their, you know, softer skills. So using um, hmm. a facial analysis tool and also combined with natural language understanding to measure people on, you know, what key attributes you want for different roles. <clears throat> um, and it's pretty cool. I mean, I'm using it right now for, for our hire for a new associate. 
and I get, you know, an, a candidate ID number and then their score in the categories that we've, we've chosen. I don't know what they look like. I don't know what they sound like unless I like drill deeper. Um, but it's, it's really, really helpful for us in terms of like trying to put everything in the same playing field. And at the macro level, like for the first time, I mean, I think this is actually the first time I think it's been like spurts of, of, you know, talk about more diversity and, um, you know, trying to make more uh, diverse teams and, and invest more broadly. But I think it's actually happening now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, nothing ever happens at the speed that I, I would like or, you know, wish. But um, this one doesn't seem to be going away this time. And I, I think that's a, a really good, good thing. Um, so we're going to get there. It's not going to be linear, um, but it, it's, it's getting there. And, yeah, I think, you know, most importantly, the, the uh, our our um, our culture our, our country is just more diverse in in nature like you know uh, mm -hmm. I guess we've you know had some different immigration policy over the last few years but like we're a pretty diverse group now it's not going away yeah um, so uh, I think more and more management teams are um, you know inherently more diverse and then um, you know for me the next thing I, I have two like other personal just you know interests around this one is like I grew up in a very blue collar family if I had more white collar people around me maybe I would have had different you know views or, or vision for my life of what I could be um I went to be you know a lawyer because I had one uncle who I loved that was a lawyer like that was my only you know kind of white collar <laughs> example um so I love working with like kids in inner cities mostly um you know, just kind of giving them like one more example of, of you know, what else you could be in your life. Because you're 16, 17, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, whatever. You don't know what venture capital is. You may not know what startups are. You might not know much of anything. And even more so if you come from a, from an inner city. So I, I do a lot of work in, in that area. And it's, uh, I don't know, I find it really helpful and, and you know, fun for me. Um, and then secondly, it's just like how we pair um, first time founders, especially, you know, who are, who are people of color or women that haven't done it before. Um, with people who have been there and like run a company, been a founder or whatever else, which just by nature of, of math tends to be a lot of white dudes. Um, so like, how do we make, you know, more organic, real connections between these people to have um, co-founders that uh, complement each other well and, uh, and or advisors or whatever else that can help like scale first time founders Mm -hmm. uh, of all backgrounds, um, but s help scale them more, more efficiently, more effectively. That was a long answer, but, um, no, no, I, I absolutely love it. <laughs> I spoke with a gentleman the other day that he, he's doing his first close on a fund focused on that for like 75 million. And, uh, he, uh, was in corporate ventures and accelerated and never saw the needle move. So I think like you said, this push is here to stay. That's what I love. Yeah. I, I love that you said that like there've been efforts, but they've kind of just fall kind of, limp in the overall spectrum of where the money's flown. Uh, so it's diving into a couple questions that have popped up from the audience here. Um, this one was asking, kind of, what is your average investment size at the seed level? I mean, I know you have your range, but. Yeah, so um, range out of fund one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hedge a little bit. So out of fund one, we do 250 to a million, uh, 1. 1.2. Our average today is 518,000. Uh, Again, we've got that LP meeting tomorrow. It's, it's fresh. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> uh, average 518,000. We have uh, 15 portfolio companies today. The uh, fund that we're uh, closing right now is, is literally a pre-seed fund that acts almost like a feeder for our, our, uh, our Roman numeral funds. Um, we'll probably do you know, a little bit earlier um, pre-seed deals um, from like 150 to 400. Mm -hmm. um, into, you know, some more areas of, so, um, fun one is like, you know, pretty, pretty focused on like software, AI, machine learning, um, which really is just, is, is just software these days. Um, everybody thinks it's very narrow and specific, but every company is an AI or, or machine learning company these days, but there are some <laughs> sectors and spaces of AI machine learning that we haven't invested in because we don't have you know, our network is so important. Like, can we arbitrage a seed stage company into their first customers? Um, you know, can we arbitrage it through our experience of like David, you know, handholding or, or adding guidance around AI strategy, things like that. Like, how can we create an unfair advantage for, for our company? And like, you know, in healthcare, for example, there's so many really cool AI 
uh, companies in healthcare that, you know, we just haven't been able to invest in because we don't have a great network there. The sales cycle is horrid. Um, mm -hmm. We don't know how to arbitrage that. Um, a lot of the bigger tech companies are better positioned like in hospitals and in healthcare facilities to like withstand the really long uh, sales cycle um, and adoption cycle um, yeah. in hospitals. So they tend to win a lot of these deals, but I'd love to do some of the deals that we're seeing in, in healthcare AI or, or uh, you know, insure tech or, or whatever else. Um, but yeah, so like for us, we'll do like some smaller earlier checks that we can learn um, in the spaces where we're not as smart today. And then mm -hmm. the great thing is, you know, we can then um, have like a front row seat to invest out of our fund one or fund two into the, the seed round for those. So, you know, for us, it's just like, we're still new kids on the block, but we want to, you know, mm -hmm. play nicely with the, the big, the big funds, um, but also start to compete with them more as they come earlier and earlier. And this is, uh, this is one way to do it. Absolutely love it. Um, and yeah, and I guess combining a few of these kind of questions a little bit is one, maybe some more specific things that have raised red flags as you're doing due diligence so they can be, uh, founders can be careful to avoid them. And then also kind of on that, when you mentioned 3,800 deals, you can't get back to everyone, um, kind of how long you should say that they should wait before kind of following up to see if they've been declined or rejected? I, I would say like, don't be afraid to follow up. Following up is, is really important. Um, realistically, you know, it's going to take us like, you know, sometimes we get to a really fast answer in, in a few days or, or a week. I try as much as possible. Like if it's going to be a no, like I'll just say it on the call of it's, it's a no and, and here's why, um, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes, um, you know, but there's a fair amount of times where I'm like, eh, I'm not sure I'm here, but I want to talk about this with the rest of our team. If somebody else can convince me that this is a space that we should be in or take a closer look at, then, you know, we'll do the, we'll do the follow-up. Um, truth is it, it's usually like a week or two um, before we, you know, usually get around to like, you know, fully reviewing and, and passing. Um, and then, you know, the, the worst case scenario, we try not to do this too much, but the worst case scenario is, is always the like, not yet. Um, you, you know, um, it's really helpful to get to know founders and VCs when you're not raising so that, you know, a not yet can actually be, we can learn from, from you and about you over, over time. Mm -hmm. um, but when somebody's in the middle of a, of a fundraise and, and we're not yet, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little tough. Um, but usually it just means we don't, you know, the verbiage I've landed on around that is like, we just, we don't have the conviction to, to move ahead right now. Um, but, you know, and what's probably going to change that is traction in, in certain areas. Mm -hmm. um, so we do invest pre-revenue, but usually with like, you know, a real technical uh, differentiator in a market that we know really well uh, with a founding team that, you know, is, is pretty well, pretty well balanced. Not necessarily repeat founders, but well balanced. Understood. I love that you mentioned that because I've been told by many people that having warm conversations say, hey, we're not raising yet, but when we introduce ourselves or mentioning a few things that they're they're going to be hitting over the next few quarters and then when you come back to the conversation you're going to remember that and if you didn't hit them you better be explained why but it's also building that operator as a founder rapport through those warmer conversations pre-fundraise um i guess going through the last couple uh here I guess, do you i guess on bridge rounds convertible notes do you invest in those and then an interesting one as well um do you invest in Founders 60 plus? Does it, does it, I mean, I guess that was a direct question there. Uh, just understanding kind of on the age of the founders. Sure. I mean, I haven't not, in the, I mean, I, I'm not sure, I haven't seen that many founders 60 plus, but my partner Mitchell is, uh, I probably shouldn't say that, but, but you know, he's, he's 60 plus. <laughs> and so I've, I've invested in him. He's invested in me. Um, you yeah, know, we've, we've, I guess we've come pretty close. Um, I, I mean, I've got one right now where it's a, a, a co-founder that's uh, 66. Um, I'm not sure I've seen it at the CEO level yet, but I mean, not a no. I, I do think there's, you know, a lot of value to experienced founders. We, we kind of like growing up founders. It's, it's helpful uh, in a lot of ways, um, but running a startup is also, a, you know, it's, a, it's an all-consuming game. So, but I, I have a lot of like, you know, my, my friends, dads from growing up and stuff who are in their 60s and 70s who will never ever s slow down or, or quit um so yeah 
Sure. Why not? Love it. And then yeah. I guess uh, two things on the one, the one, the convertible note bridge round. Is that something you've done or is it more just equity? Yeah, we do it. I mean, I, uh, okay. Yeah. There's no delicate way to say it. I, I despise convertible notes. I despise safes. I hate nearly everything about them. I think they're horrible for founders. I think they're horrible for VCs. I wish they'd be like wiped out um, for a first investment into a company. I think it is okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it's an actual bridge round if we're already in a company and, you know, we've been on the board, you know, and, and uh, some, some additional capital will get them to the next round, series A or whatever. Um, but as a first investment, um, only have only do it in, in very specific situations, namely where it's a really small uh, pre-seed deal. We, we feel very confident in the founders um, and there's a good chance that we will can or will lead uh, the actual price round that comes after it. Gotcha. Otherwise, I think they're horrible. <laughs> I, I've heard similar things by certain, uh, certain uh, this is not doing this in multiple months, but uh, I guess with that too, kind of, can you comment a little bit more on kind of the equity terms to your early stage investments, usually kind of what the range may fall and then getting a little bit more clarity for these founders. And then also, I guess, kind of general towards the overall ecosystem, defining a round because like, what's a pre-seed, what's a seed, what's this? Cause it's all just the number that's coming up and you see how they're defined differently on the coast versus different regions. And I'm like, I hate it probably as much as you do, but I was just curious if you could give any more clarity on your, your kind of equity terms and what you guys are kind of going on and then kind of where that is moving as more capital flows towards uh, the industry. Yeah, so um, to take the first question, you know, we, we target companies um, that have a, you know, pre-money valuation of 10 million or less usually for our first check-in. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've We've broken it. We've broken it a little bit here and there, um, you know, for for the right deal. But just you know, VC math takes over, and at some point it gets hard to you know own enough of the company for us, um, you know, mm -hmm. anything more than that right now. Um, so it just sort of depends on the, <clears throat> the round dynamics and and other stuff. Um, but usually around under ten million is what we look for. <clears throat> I think our average right now is like um, like seven seven point two million pre money. Um, and, you know, again, average check is 500, uh, a little over 500. Um, yeah. And then your second question was oh, the just, round designations. Yeah. Like. I mean, the rounds, the, the round names are, are, are pretty stupid, but, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's yeah. just sort of like, I, I honestly think it's just VC bullshit and, and branding <clears throat> so that everybody can say that they invest early. You know, the average seed round today is $2.2 million. I mean, do you, is, is that really a, a seed round? I think, you know, what's played out over time is as, as like, you know, the, as there's more money and there's so much more money in the system and it's so much less expensive to start a tech company than, than it was, you know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have a lot of different stages uh, or phases of the company mm -hmm. um, that, you know, creates this multi seed round um, ladder that you have to climb. Um, the way I, I, you know, the way we usually think about it is that there's going to be, we expect there will be three seed rounds um, before series A. Um, and we invest in all three, um, but with different, different characteristics, different, different rules, different ways of operating in each one um, and different things that we look for. So, you know, I would say like <laughs> seed, seed tier one is usually that like, you know, pre, pre revenue, <clears throat> um, well rounded team, you know, probably well respected on the technical side of things. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do something kind of like buy our way in there and, and, and watch the company smaller check. Um, and, you know, just kind of coach them up and put them in a position to like be ready for a real seed round. Yeah. Ideally, the net, you know, seed two is like actual seed round, you know, two to $4 million round. They're kind of you know, ready to scale and improve out that what they've built and, and their POCs are converting and, and um, mm -hmm. you know, are, are repeatable. And then there's kind of like the late seed round where like, all right, we've got, you know, 
half million, million dollars of revenue, another $2 million round, $4 million round will be like, you know, really getting us to, you know, pretty predictably getting us to the series A. That's how we think about it. And then like for us, just risk mitigating, like, you know, okay, can we lead the next round if things don't go exactly right? And then yeah. stuff like that. And that kind of hints into the, I guess, the next, the last little thing here on these two questions. One, how much is the startup's cap table influencing your investment uh, valuations is one. And then two, you mentioned the metrics and KPIs. So what you're looking at for metrics and KPIs are kind of delegated based on those rounds, I assume. But, you know, POCs, customers, MR, AR, you name it. Um, and you kind of already touched on the, your view on the longer sales cycles in some industries where you don't think you can add that strategic advantage uh, from differentials. And that's where you've kind of, I guess, held back in those certain areas. Yeah. Um, cap table first. Cap, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, cap table first. Cap table is a huge deal. I mean, huge deal. Um, it's, I, I can't believe how much time I spend cleaning up cap tables. Um, it's just, you know, even, even, I mean, these Ocker lists are, are, you know, our first investment Ocker list, um, you know, series, series B company, um, have, have grown really fast. Uh, we're just named, you know, best growing FinTech in, in the U S by Inc magazine, um, have brought in, you know, big, you know, big VCs, uh, along the way. So I, I've been on the board for Brockerlist for three years. I've, I've known Sam for about four years, CEO. You know, they raise so much. They talk about cobbling together a seed round. Like they have, you know, every every bobbly on earth. Uh, Sam's Sam's last name and family is is was on the cap table, and um, you know, neighbors, relatives, you know, angel investors. Like as a you know, angel groups. Like it is wild. Um, and you know, fortunately, we we. Um, you know, brought in some really good lead investors for the Series A, Bullpen Capital and QED, who just like knew how to do the work, roll up their sleeves and clean up the cap table and set the company on a much healthier financial track. Um, <clears throat> I learned a lot from that experience, actually. And uh, it's something that I've, I've done a lot of with some of our other, our other portfolio companies along the way, just give me the confidence and know how to do it. And, and like, you know, what what it, what it needs to look like to get to that next, you know, Series A uh, yeah. without like, you want your cap table and like your founder ownership to be like lights out, like checkbox when you're going into your series A, series B. If it's a red flag at all, like it's just such a, there's so many other things that can kill your deal. Like you just don't want your cap table to be, to be one of those things. Um, so super important. And um, yeah, I could probably go on about that a lot longer, but um, really. Yeah, cap, the cap table is messy. You're, you're getting your chances killed before you even get to the tranches. Yeah, I mean, look, you you raise the way you the, you raise the way you, you you raise, and if you know, end of the day, like the traction's there and the numbers look good and everything else, like you're gonna get the money and you'll find somebody like like bullpen or us that knows how to do it and is willing to like go through the pain of cleaning up a cap table, come in and clean up your cap table, and um, but if not, you're gonna hang yourself on your cap table. It's it's a it's a dangerous spot to be. <laughs> I hear you. Well, with that, I'll hand it back over to Dan for a little bit. Uh, I know he's probably been chomping at the bit to chime in. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, hey, we're coming up to the end of an hour, uh, and and I think Nick is going to stick around for for a little bit more to to kind of go into overtime and, and answer a few more questions. But I did want to be respectful of everyone that's joined us that might have another meeting coming up here at the, at the top of the hour. Uh, we will send an email out to everyone uh, that that's attended this webinar uh, with information on on our wonderful partners and how to get in touch with them, as well as a link to the video. Uh, so we'll follow up with you um, and we'll also share our upcoming events. We have an, a panel event next week uh, that's focused on Latinx investors and founders. Uh, so we do a lot of work um, as we build community, thinking about underrepresented groups, uh, and whether that's Black founders, women founders, Latinx founders, um, and how uh, the issues surrounding each of those communities uh, affect not just the founders, but the investor community as well. So we'd love to have you join us for that. Uh, and we will have another Meet the VC uh, next month. Uh, we haven't posted it on our website yet, but it is on December 9th. 
Uh, so keep an eye out for that, but we will follow up via email. So for all those that have to drop, thank you for attending. For all those sticking around, again, we're gonna dive into some more questions and, and I'm gonna throw out a question for Nick because I have been chomping at the bit. Um, what, one of the questions that came in from the audience was about how COVID uh, has in, affected uh, the investing process. I'm gonna put a, a, a slightly different spin on that um, because what we see both with all the relationships with our founders and our startups, as well as VCs, is a big impact on that has been the mental health of founders. Uh, and I think uh, that people are struggling, right? People are struggling to get through the day. There's a whole different boatload of issues that have kind of come into play here. And so I'd love to hear from your perspective um, how you're helping your portfolio companies, your founders, advice you can give to our founders here uh, on, on the webinar today about how they, they might address some of these issues. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a Bostonian and, and I'm, you know, we're not, we're not always great at saying things in the most delicate way, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, it sucks. I mean, it, it's a, uh, it's a brutal time. And uh, I think, you know, for me personally, like I'm a, I'm, you know, nearly 40 year old guy and I'm single. I have no kids. Um, and I have to get out of my apartment every day. I, I you know, did it for two months. I've worked from home before. Like I gotta get out, <laughs> you know, here I'm sitting in, you know, our office, uh, Mitchell's here, but you know, most days it's me sitting here by myself and like just getting out, moving around, going through the, that process of like leaving my house, going to work and coming back is, is helpful for me. I've always wanted to come. I've always needed a combination of, of like at home, in the office and, and traveling. Um, so like, it's important for my mental health. I know that, um, you know, from a, you know, purely VC and, and board member uh, perspective, um, it, it's tough. I mean, we've, um, it's like the business side of things that we we're trying to take things off of the, the plates of, of some of our founders. Um, like where can we just help out and, and maybe get Tiffany on my team to, you know, work on a couple of things. Um, if a founder is struggling with like, kids, family, just getting, getting time alone or, or, you know, away from the business even to spend with the kids and family. Um, that's not like in a stressful, stressful way. So I think just try and take where we can off their plates. And secondly, you know, again, again, to the human part, more human part of this in, in a minute, but like as an investor and board member, like you just have to be prepared for, you know, I never in my wildest dreams could have imagined, you know, 70% of, of, of businesses being shut down um, and, and you know, the economy coming to a screeching halt from a global pandemic. Like that was not in any of my risk models anywhere. However, like it's just another issue of like, okay, you know, how do we redirect our companies into, you know, our, our sort of early mantra was like, obviously, you know, review your burn or the, the areas you can and should, should scale back to keep the business alive. Secondly is, are there industries or markets that are gonna to continue to spend you know, even during a, a substantial downturn like, like the government um, where you can pivot your sales efforts to and, and maybe try and get some more customers and traction in that space. And then, you know, and or uh, the, the third thing is kind of like, what do you want your company to be? Like if there's something that um, um, has been like burning in, in your product roadmap or in your sales structure or the, or the makeup of your team, like now's the time to try and correct that. So back in March and April, we were saying, hey, like let's expect this, you know, let's say January, um, the world starts to get back to its regular. What do you want X, Y, and Z company to be? Like, what do you want, you know, Knockery? What do you want Ocarless? What do you want, you know, any of our portfolio companies to be come January? And for us, it's just helped to like really focus on what's important for each of these businesses and, you know, maybe take a step back and like change the messaging or, or build a new, new feature or new product. And, um, you know, I, I, I can't give too many examples, um, you know, openly here, I guess, but um, there's been some really good examples of, of steps made. On the personal side of things, I, I, you know, do spend a lot of time just like talking to our founders, our CEOs on a, on a uh, personal level. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I live this too. Like being a venture capitalist is a oddly lonely job. Um, you can't really talk about, you know, things that go wrong <laughs> all, all that much or with many people. Um, so like I've gone to a therapist myself for, for years and it, it, I go every two weeks or every four weeks, whatever I feel like I need or have time for. And it's somebody that I can 
you know, pay to sit there and listen to me gripe about whatever the hell I want to gripe about. If, you know, my mom's driving me crazy, like I can talk about that. If, if you know, girlfriend is in a, in a bad spot or whatever, like you talk about that. If it's work stuff, like it's, I know it's not going to leave that room. So I recommend that for everybody in whatever shape or form they can, they can do it. And then lastly, it's like learning how to um, take advantage of whatever downtime you have um, to kind of um, refresh yourself. And, you know, sometimes you have 10 minutes to yourself. You've got to learn how to like <laughs> take advantage of those, those 10 minutes, recharge, refresh, whatever it is. Sometimes you have an hour, sometimes you have a day or a weekend, like whatever you have, you have to sort of like plan for it or, or recognize that you're in your downtime and figure out what it is you do that like clears your head. For me, like I'm a big walker. Like I can walk, I do audio books. I'm not a great reader, but I'm a great listener. Um, that helps me a ton. Like I, you know, I'm a washed up athlete. I don't love working out aggressively that much anymore. I'm not a CrossFit guy. And like walking just like clears my head for whatever reason. So like if I've got a half hour, um, I'll, I'll probably go bang out a walk and either do it in silence or listen to, you know, some shitty music from the nineties or, or an audio book. Fabulous advice. There, there's a blog post uh, that Brad Feld, uh, one of your fellow VCs, wrote five years ago titled, Something New is Effed Up in My World Every Day. <laughs> uh, and it's just his motto to kind of set his reality uh, and recognize that, that every day he's got to deal with some demons uh, to kind of get through the day. Uh, I'll share the link to the blog post in the chat for, for our audience. but. Um, but I do think finding even just 10 minutes a day, whether it's a walk or it's a headspace session or whatever it takes that can just kind of get you to be able to catch your breath uh, and heal yourself mentally uh, and then ensure that you're building up your support ne network around you, um, both personal therapists and professional coaches. Um, I think these are all valuable resources that certainly have been highlighted in this time. Phil, I don't, I've got, I can, Continue asking questions. Um, well, I got a, I got a couple just throughout. I uh, kind of tie this all up, guys. And I, I know personal programs and different things that Nick and his team and his partners do to support their founders, which I think is amazing because uh, different founders being able to lean on one another because they're as lonely as VC is. Sometimes you want to be able to talk kind of founder to founder for unbiased uh, feedback as well. Um, but I guess one thing was talking about the, the raises and crowdfunding and your thoughts on that and how it pertains to, uh, you know, more equity rounds that you're doing and your viewpoints on that when a founder comes to you, if they went through that route. Um, the, sorry, the, the uh, equity, equity crowdfunding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I, I think, I think it's good. I, you know, the, um, the, we're in a new state of, of how deals get done. And, um, as an investor, uh, you know, I probably have a bit of a different view on this of like, I think it's better to bring more people around the table um, for a company at a certain stage. So like, and, and, and that, that takes on different, different meanings. Long story short, like my advice to founders is like raise money, however you can raise money to start your business because at the seed stage, like the math is so crazy stacked against you for getting investment from a VC fund, you know, right out of the gate that like, you just have to get the money and, and this is what you know people want and they you know you know sometimes rightfully so complain that vcs don't take you know early enough risks or whatever else um mm -hmm. it's just a lot of other sources of capital out there to go find it and you know the, the reality is if like if you find capital you know out of pretty much anywhere and grow your business enough you know at, at really I, I find venture capital to be like a velocity business as much as anything if you grow your business big enough and, and fast enough and, and have the right people, you know, on the journey with you, the VC money will come. There's no question. Like, we will find you, <laughs> you know, the, we, will, we will hunt you down and find you. <laughs> no, like, especially series a, right. Like series A, series B, like that's a, I should say series B and beyond is like a different plan from what I do. Like for us, seed stage investing, like, you know, every founder that, that we're meeting with is more or less banking, hoping for, us to take a, a shot on them, right? And then for us, it's then like, can we take a shot on these guys and then, you know, bring in other co-investors with us and mitigate our risk and bring the right people around the table to mm -hmm. like set it on a healthy, healthy trajectory. Whereas Series B, like if you're if you're going, if you're going at the right pace, you've got VCs, you know, 
pounding on your door and it's a very competitive business at, at that stage. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different job, I think, in, in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, I raise my heart we can. You know, I've, I've, had, I've had black founders, I've had Latino founders, I've had women founders ask me if it was bad to take money from you know, one of these groups that's you know, really focused on, on diverse founders. And I was like, no, <laughs> like, you know, take the money, like however you can get it, like take it. It's not gonna reflect poorly. Um, and you know, it's still gonna be hard to raise a seed round regardless of where your earlier money came from or series A. But if you, if you can you know, prove the business out, it'll all be good. Just focus on building a good business. That's it. Money's green and has no gender, right? Um. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, uh-huh. it's, just, it's just like getting into the system. Like the problem is, is truly you know, the, the, mm-hmm. the network part of it and, and the access part of it to, to VCs. And like the whole you know, not reviewing cold pitch decks and you have to be introduced by another VC. Like, that shit's ancient. Like that needs to die. Um, look, it's not a bad thing. Like obviously, you know, respect those relationships and get good deals from our VC partners. But like to say, we don't look at, you know, deals mm-hmm. that can do us cold. Like why? Like, you know, that, that's what, that's what I get paid to do. Like literally it's my job. And if I went to my LPs and said, Oh yeah, we, you know, we get 300 deals a year from VCs that we look at seriously. And the other 3,500 we throw in the trash, like get out of here. Like, you know, so, so the same summation is, at the early stage, raise money any way you can. And for VCs, like, we're trying to find that deal any way we can. So, um, yeah, exactly. Last kind of question, wrap up this. Uh, this it's been absolutely amazing. And thank you, Nick. Uh, is one, any tips on calculating valuation for a pre revenue company? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I thought. Uh, I'm like, eh, it's pretty tough on that one. But um, before I go to that, I just want to point out Cor- uh, Corey in, in the, in the, chat just said something really true is startups are about survival and it's um it, it's actually remarkably true and i actually found the same thing when i was fundraising for differential um so much of it is just like being in the in the game and like mm-hmm. having these conversations over and over and over again with with vcs or, or angel investors or, or whatever else over over time one of my favorite deals that like we didn't get to invest in was a company called link squares up in boston uh, i knew the founder well i mentored him out of northeastern's incubator and every uh, I was literally just starting differential, which is why we didn't invest. But every single month, he sent me uh, a screenshot uh, of the new customers. Like you'd have new logos, number of new customers and AR. And he would text it to me every month. <laughs> and and uh, it was brilliant. And like, as he did that, like, even though I wasn't in a spot to invest, like I introduced him around to a lot of VCs and you know, he's, he, he raised some money and he's gone on to raise Series B. They're, they're fine. But he was in the game for a long time. It's just a matter of like being out there and like interacting in, in a very, you know, human way. Because a lot of what we're evaluating is like your ability to, to sell. And also the same thing for me at Differential. Like we hit a certain point where I did some crazy, you know, probably risky stuff that most fund managers don't do um, early on. And it fortunately worked out for, for me. Um, but like we had a certain inflection point where all of a sudden fundraising was, was a hell of a lot easier. Yeah. Uh, I don't say easy, but easier. Um, so great comment by Corey, totally true. Don't feel bad. Like it's, you know, Shark Tank is like ruined entrepreneurs for thinking you walk in, you give a 10 minute pitch, you walk out with a check from Cuban, like just not, not how it goes. Like it's yeah. even for us when we make a decision right away, it's still a three month process to get through deal docs and, and, you know, negotiations and everything else. Um, be persistent, don't badger, but like your persistence shows how much you're in this, you know, yeah, we're, we're evaluating you as a salesperson because we're banking on, on the, the founder to be able to sell probably the first million dollars of revenue, hopefully the first million, if not more. Um, and if you suck at it, that's, that's, you know, that's tough. Um, that's a sign that we need to just evaluate. Valuations for pre-revenue companies. I have no idea. Like, you know, <laughs> you know I know what I think makes sense. Um, my recommendation is if you're not, you know, like a repeat founder who's done it and made, you know, somebody like Graycroft or Andreessen a bunch of money before, um, you know, start start pretty small <laughs> uh, because you just don't want to put too much pressure on your future fundraising because, you know, one of the worst things like setting a safe, you know, the cap on a safe or on a convertible note or whatever too high. And then a VC has to come in and like, you know, cram that down because the optics of being a down round um even if it's you know just converting a note into into equity um it's just like a lot of a lot of mistakes that get get made i think early Mm -hmm. on so like you know if you're pre-revenue and you're a first-time founder or or, you know 
along those lines or, you know, not a hugely successful founder. Pre-revenue, I, I, you know, try and keep your, um, uh, you know, valuation somewhere between like four and 10 million, depending on what you're mm -hmm. doing, and what geography you're in. Um, sometimes even lower, but, um, you know, it, it, it varies. Appreciate that. And last one for the day, because I liked it, it was actually done, directed towards differential, is you're evaluating very technical companies. How technical should it be in the differentiator in the pitch deck? Because you can only show so much to grab your attention, but you're really doing a lot more, I think, to David is your guy that goes in deep. Uh, but uh, no, I just wanted to give a little more feedback on that one. Not that deep, actually, in your pitch deck. Um, I think I think most pitch decks should be like 10, 10 to 12 slides. Um, if, if you can't get to the like, you know, what are you doing? Why is it important? And, and you know, who are you? And, um, you know, why are you going to win this market in, in 10 slides or, or less? And I feel the same way. You know, again, I have to fundraise. Uh, when I put a pitch deck together, I try and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, if you can't get to the point in those 10 slides, then something's wrong. Um, I think a lot of technical founders have, tend to have like way too much product stuff up, up front. Um, and then your business founders uh, who don't have traction yet tend to have like these massive, like, you know, MBA dissertations about the market size. Like we don't care about that shit. Like one, one slide on market size and why it's important is, is good. Like we think about this stuff all day. So we get paid to do. So like just get to get to you as fast as possible. Um, so, and then, you know, from there, like, you know, technically you're probably gonna dig into your credentials more so than, um, than, um, than the, the, the technical aspect of the product uh, of, you know, what the claim it does, um, because that will give us a pretty good indication of what's, you know, what, what the capabilities of the team are um, beyond just what it is today. Love it. Well, I'll hand it back to Dan to see if he has any closing comments. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I had a lot of fun this afternoon. But uh, thank you for being here, Nick. And uh, Dan, I'll let you wrap it up. Yeah, I have a big closing comment. Nick, that was awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Thanks. And Phil, yeah. thank you as well. Great job. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Again, we hope to see you back next week uh, at our Latinx investor and founder panel uh, and next month on December 9th uh, at our next installment of Meet the VC. Uh, for everyone at Early Growth, uh, have a great Veterans Day. Uh, if you are a veteran, thank you for your service, and thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye.